The rage virus is an extremely fast-acting, fast-turning, and fast-infecting disease that spread through the population of England at such a rate the military and government would ultimately fail to contain the ailment, which led to millions of people succumbing and in turn infecting those around them. As mere days passed after patient zero was turned, a mass exodus would quickly become necessary as barricades were overrun by the teeming hordes of violent infected. One man in particular would be confined to his room during the events to emerge 28 days after the outbreak. Finding in an abandoned London, who would make his way through until finally realizing that while he was out, something big had just gone down. This virus courses through the veins of humans, making them violent, faster than your average person, and with an endurance that far surpasses what you and I are capable of. But what exactly are the biological interactions of this rage virus? Let's discuss that in today's episode, covering both movies 28 days later and 28 weeks later, because you know we're going to have to discuss that carrier status and immunity exhibited. So for all those not too familiar with the movie, or how it all began, it all starts with scientists trying to science. An idea was formed at Cambridge University that what if humans drive towards violence and anger could be controlled? What if we didn't have to succumb to our natural primal urges, at least concerning aggression, and instead could take a medicine that would make, say, the most vicious of criminals behave in what is considered a normal range of emotional status? Well, these two scientists had this idea, and they set out to identify the hormones responsible for anger. Well, hormones and neurochemicals anyways, and subsequently developed a countermeasure to control Control it. A violent criminal was used as a test subject instead of students in the surrounding area as it was decided they lacked the chemicals necessary within them as clearly they weren't aggressive enough. When the inhibitor was injected into the criminal, it had virtually no effect on him and the subject was set to attack. He was immediately put down and as the scientists were burying him, one of them sneezed. So in science, there are these things called ethics and you're about to see what is the exact opposite of this. It was decided at this point that a pill was not enough to administer as this was sort of involving choice and somebody who's violent might not want to kind of cease those violent tendencies. And with the need to subdue human nature now apparently, it was decided that this inhibitor needed to be unleashed in an aerosolized form on the general population with kind of zero disregard. I cannot even begin to explain how stupid of an idea this is to release an untested, zero peer reviewed, and understudied cure on humanity, but I think the outbreak will speak for itself. To build this new aerosolized form of cure, the Ebola virus was altered to carry the dosage, along with certain portions of the disease changed so that you wouldn't actually get Ebola. It became clear that the test subjects would be needed to complete these tasks. Chimpanzees were infected with the modified strains of Ebola after locating the genome within the virus for delivery. Things were looking pretty unethical in here, and the virus mutated within the primates. Instead of inhibiting rage, the apes would tailspin out into a violent state, and this would be known as the rage virus. After realizing what they had done, one of the scientists contacted an animal rights group, told them what had happened, and then took himself out of the game. The group arrived to break the animals free, and despite the scientists warning them that the disease they carried was pretty much lethal, they were freed anyhow. This marks hour zero of the outbreak. With a quick attack from the chimpanzee, the first human was turned in mere moments and went into a violent rage. From here, they would escape and move out of Cambridge University to the surrounding cities and countryside, infecting all those who they came across. Fast forward to 28 days later, and Jim finally wakes up from his coma. Initially, he was a bike courier who had been hit by a car and seemingly suffered some head trauma. After shaking off the disorientation, he moved to his hospital door where a key had been slid under by presumably hospital staff. In case he ever woke up, he would at least have a fighting chance. After moving through the city and finding it abandoned, he would go on to run into other survivors and find out firsthand what he was facing. Humans were not able to be reasoned with and would attack at the slightest sound or light. He would also learn what others around him were willing to do to stay alive should a member of the group become infected. Ultimately, he would go on to meet a father and daughter, and we get our first look at the infection rate time from a small dosage. Upon the father getting a small amount of blood in his eye from a crow snacking on a manwich, he would turn in under 30 seconds and begin attacking the group he was just traveling with. However, during his attack, remnants of the military who were trying to establish a new order showed up and saved them, albeit this is really just momentarily. Their real intentions were less order and more chaos and decadence. But ultimately, Jim would overcome them by releasing an infected member into their stronghold and saving Selena and Hannah until ultimately they were rescued by the real military, still doing sweeps of the area looking for survivors and infected alike. So with that quick, and I mean quick rundown, as I could do a dedicated video just giving you a summary of what happened, which I don't think that would really be that much fun for anyone because we're here for science, we can see the disaster and how it affects individuals' minds and bodies. But now we get to the good stuff of how does this disease work and what was affected by this disease because let me tell you, it's biology heavy and you love to see it. So let's discuss the idea first, the rage chemical. It is known in humans that rage can come from damage to the brain, specifically in the prefrontal cortex, amygdala, and angular gyrus. The prefrontal cortex is associated with moral judgments and should it be damaged, a person may not understand the choice they are taking and the implications 
variations of it as well. The amygdala is associated with aggression and maternal instincts, but it's still very much so the same in males. And it is also an extremely old part of the brain. So we all love the term, the lizard brain. And the angular gyrus is located around the parietal lobe. If damaged, it is associated with depression, poor memory, frustration, and belligerence. The reason for these three specific portions of the brain being called out is because damage to them can also lead to release of other chemicals in improper proportions or perhaps even a deficiency of chemicals. The idea of serotonin in deficient numbers leading to anger is a long studied topic. Some have deemed it too simple as usually with the brain there is usually more than one thing causing issues, typically because of the neurochemicals associated with like every function. So instead it's sort of a cascade effect with multiple issues leading to the problem. But the generalized thinking is that those who are prone to outbursts or aggression are those that have serotonin levels diminished when samples are taken from their cerebral spinal fluid. So increasing the amount of serotonin in the brain would fix the issue, right? Well, yes and no. But before getting to that, where might this deficiency come from? It could be something as simple as your brain having a naturally lower level due to genetic issues, but another reason could be because of the damage leading to lower numbers, or even inability to release serotonin in the right amount. So why is it a yes and a no? Increasing serotonin levels is what's affecting anger as these sort of help balance out emotion and mood. This would help a person, and injecting a nice shot of serotonin into infected might also help. But this isn't a permanent fix because the rage chemical is still there affecting the brain's functions and actions. What the scientists were working on also was an inhibitor as it binds to a chemical or receptor rendering it useless so that the neural pathways are not activated. And inhibiting serotonin would also just lead to more rage. The chemical they were actually looking for is known as arginine vasopressin. This particular chemical is produced in the brain, specifically the amygdala, which again is associated with aggression in humans during its activation. In fact, if this particular point of the mind is overstimulated, this can lead to near constant outbursts and violent behavior. Violent criminals have had their brain scans done where this area is shown to light up, indicating too much activity and also more readily available activity than those with more controlled emotions. This area of the brain is also what helps mothers go absolutely ham on people if they get near their offspring and it sends them into a violent rage, which we all know the story of the mom literally picking up a car off her son after he was entrapped. But this is important as it shows the physical ramifications of neurochemicals and what kind of effect they can have on our strength and endurance, which we will also discuss momentarily. So now that we know what chemical they were after, what is the inhibitor? Likely there are two possibilities concerning how this would work. The first is an injection of compatible structures which would actually bind to the chemical itself. When they did, the release of this chemical into the synaptic gap or elsewhere would stop it from being able to bind with its co-receptor. With the binding not possible, the pathway would be stopped and the signal not sent to the next neuron. This would stop the violent aggression, at least presumably. The second method would be to bind to the co-receptor itself. However, doing so may actually activate this pathway, so this may not have been the desired outcome. It could be possible to find a portion of the receptor blocking the chemical from attaching, however, if multiple receptors were needed. If this is the case, then this would be the most long-term effective as the inhibitor would not have to keep finding new chemicals to attach to. It was all so perfect, but went completely awry when it was introduced into the primate population. While chimps are fairly similar to humans, they do lack certain cells and chemicals that humans have. For instance, simian immunodeficiency virus, or SIV, or human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV, are different in terms of lethality because chimps lack the cells necessary to progress SIV to acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, or AIDS, whereas humans have those tissues to progress the illness to AIDS, which ends up taking us out. Differences like this means it needs to be studied heavily to assess what is being affected and do humans possess the ability to transfer those exact results. Ebola was the virus chosen for its virulent properties and ability to infect cells by force, introducing this inhibitor. When introduced to the chimps, however, this genome would alter slightly, changing the inhibitor, creating the opposite effect. This leads me to believe that the receptors on the neurons themselves were the target. It may be that the finely tuned inhibitor changed very slightly, and instead of blocking the receptor, it inadvertently activates it. This inhibitor was likely to be designed to block most of, if not all, the rage pathways in the brain, but with this mutation, it would end up actually activating all these pathways, and you can kind of start to see how this might be an issue. It was first seen with the chimps that their propensity to anger and aggression was well beyond that of what was normal. After the animal group were attacked and bitten, the Ebola virus origins inhibitor would quickly enter their bloodstream and begin infecting them, activating all the rage pathways of the mind, while also still having some of the effects of Ebola, such as tissue liquefaction. The infection timing of the virus stated in the movies is roughly about 20 to 40 seconds, depending on the dosage. And I would have to say that is actually completely ludicrous. Biological processes do not move that quickly, and there is no way incubation time would be that quick. I know I'm being a stick in the mud, but for something like this to happen, hours to days 
these would be the minimum needed. And we will actually discuss that here in a moment, but getting off my soapbox, it appears as though the infection routes are bodily fluids in direct contact with mucous membranes or other persons not infected bodily fluids. If you get the rage virus, blood on your skin, you are actually okay. But should any get into your mouth or eyes or saliva actually pierce the skin of a person, they will succumb to the rage virus quite quickly after that and begin attacking their comrades. But what do we see with the infected? Getting a look at them, let's specifically discuss their eyes for a moment. And the reason is this idea comes up in the second movie as well. When a person is infected, the capillaries in their eyes burst and their iris turns red. Literally, they are so angry they are seeing red. But it would appear that during this event, taking into consideration the liquefaction of their organs and bleeding, capillaries of the iris have burst as well, leading to blood accumulating within the eyes, meaning that they may actually eventually go blind. An interesting thing to note as well about the infected is their drive, which is borderline sadistic, to infect non-infected. First, they have the Ebola virus, so fluids are leaking out of them constantly. They will actually use this fluid to drip into people's faces or vomit on them to infect those not experiencing the glory of rage. They will also outright attack anyone who does not appear infected and seek out more to satiate their anger as well. One of the more interesting things that can be seen with the chimp is that it was clapping as the person was being attacked at the beginning, which mirrors Dawn and 28 weeks later, seemingly taking glee and attacking or seeing others attacked. This suggests higher brain functions are still happening, but the prefrontal cortex is majorly subdued. But what about the physiological effects of the mind kicking into overdrive concerning your rage? When you enter a state of fear or anger or fight or flight or anything like that, your body begins dumping chemicals into your bloodstream in response to the chemicals upstairs dictation, mainly adrenaline. Under times of extreme stress, this chemical makes you almost superhuman in a way. You can run faster, hit harder, think quicker, and hopefully overpower any attacker to survive. Usually the body will begin to calm back down after the danger has passed, which can actually still leave residual effects such as shaking and exhaustion after depleting your body in such a short amount of time. The issue with the rage virus is that this adrenaline is actually never shut off. As seen with the infected, they can overpower virtually anyone, even if that person is dumping adrenaline into their system as well. They can also outrun most people too, as the non-infected succumb to exhaustion by natural processes that just do not seem to affect the infected. But there is a massive catch to this. While the average non-infected is slower and weaker, they actually listen to their meat suits, something that the infected are no longer able to do through the noise brought on by the concoction of neurochemicals and hormones being dumped into their bloodstream. The main issue with the infected is their vulnerability to their own needs. Unlike something like a zombie, the infected in 28 days later are truly just infected, meaning that if you were able to cut off the source of their ailment, they would likely return to normal. But seeing as that's not possible as research was in its infancy, they're really just people running around for days at a heightened stress level, not eating, not drinking, always fighting, always running. The issue is though, is that the body can run on adrenaline for a while and stored fat reserves, but this will metabolically deplete the body. We actually see at the end that before too much longer, the body begins to become decrepit and completely devoid of muscle tone or fat. This is the final point of life for those infected. With no incoming nutrition, they fall to their biological needs, limiting the outbreak as long as it is contained. During the outbreak, however, the virulence of this inhibitor is something, honestly, like an Ebola outbreak. Ebola is exceedingly contagious should you come into contact with bodily fluids, and that's something the infected specialize in. However, I would have to say with the breakdown of internal organs, this creates a whole host of issues. So I'm going to do something I haven't tried before, and now I'm no film critic or anything, but I'm going to critique the absolute living crap out of this movie's infection and discuss what would actually happen. Firstly, the jump from chimps to humans. While possible with HIV, the issue is compatibility. We see that with HIV specifically, this was more than likely a multiple exposure event rather than just a single dose issue. With the rage virus, the mutation specifically happened in chimps, meaning that it was adapted to their bodies and their genetic coding, not ours. To make that leap would require quite a bit of exposure and time, meaning this is not likely to occur like it did and instead would really just mean you got beat up by a really angry chimp. Another issue I see is with the inhibitor itself. The mind is a tapestry of interactions, all very necessary to making you, you. Completely shutting off one chemical in the brain because it was deemed bad with very little research how it would likely have severe consequences for the operation of the brain. This could actually wreck your brain's ability to operate. It's all about balance, not just stopping a chemical. Next, the Ebola virus. The Ebola virus. Why would you choose a virus like this instead of something a little more benign like the flu? This virus is extremely detrimental to your body for a multitude of reasons, but mainly its ability to completely melt your organs and liquefy you internally. I've stated this a few times, but this is my absolute biggest issue with the infected. We see them spewing out fluids constantly. 
recently. Going back to the metabolism of the body, this is my main gripe. As it turns out, we need water and food to survive. With the organs liquefying, first off, you are spewing up water at an alarming rate, but also you are not able to take in nutrition as the organs are not operational. You drop in three days with no water under normal circumstances, but with this infection, you would drop in literal hours. After you begin coughing up bodily fluids and sweating and running around, it just doesn't make any sense. The scientists that chose the Ebola virus rather than a more, like I said, benign form of like flu, must have been on a whole different level of dumb ideas. Not to mention, they didn't even subdue the portion of the virus responsible for apoptosis brought on to the cells by the body. It seems as though they tried to, but with very little research into that area and to see if it actually worked, especially when you have a ton of chimpanzees throwing up blood, this wasn't just a mutation, this was negligence. Another issue I would have to say is the actual lifespan of the infected. It is stated that it took weeks, which we will get to momentarily, for the infected to drop off. Again, that's not likely. Hours of spewing up fluids would render the muscles so weak, the blood so coagulated in the body, and the brain so dehydrated that delirium would follow, and then quickly immobilization. Nutrition has nothing to do with it. Once again, it all goes back to water. Without it, you drop. Simple as that. And the body under these extreme situations needs more water than normal, and with them hemorrhaging the water out of themselves, longevity is severely decreased. Also to bring up, incubation time. The fact is with a virus, if it is too virulent and destructive, it's actually better for humanity. Because if it is not able to move through a population effectively, as it takes the host out too quickly to infect others. The rage virus is a perfect example of this. The host is still up and moving under real circumstances though, the body would fall apart so fast, the virus not be able to effectively spread to others. However, this is negated by suggesting that the virus takes literal seconds after coming into contact with the bloodstream to infect someone, but again there's no way man. A virus must first attach to a cell, infect the cell, and then the genome is read and the body begins producing whatever particular structure the virus wanted it to or coded for. In most cases, this is usually other viruses. But in this case, it's the inhibitor activating the rage pathway. This happens so quickly that it suggests it's not even using cellular mechanisms, but then goes on to also be relying on the adrenal pathways to give the infected its strength. The reality would be once you are bitten, it would take hours to days for the symptoms to manifest, which is more than enough time for you to be quarantined. But there are several issues with the outbreak, as you can see, and I mean, there are more than just these, but something I found particularly odd was the blending of real symptoms like rabies mixed with how the body soldiers on despite massive damage. In one particular point, you actually see a soldier who was infected in the second movie with internal organs exposed. A hit like this suggests spinal damage and lack of ability to breathe. And I'm sorry, but no. There is no way this guy is up and walking around if all circumstances with the virus are based on mundane happenings. He would not be breathing. After like two minutes of not breathing, especially walking around, you would probably just completely black out. But you know, with zombie movies, there's this idea that they aren't exactly alive, but suggested by these movies' rules, these are infected, not zombies, which indicates they are alive and must rely on bodily functions, otherwise the infection wouldn't have ended weeks later due to starvation. Yet, they are able to push their bodies past physical limits to survive even a day of infection. Alright, so enough nerding out on these issues. Now that you have a pretty good grasp on what the infection does and how it interacts with the body, we can finally move into quite possibly the worst idea the military has ever had, which I can only imagine was made up by someone who is missing half their brain. The movie and plan that takes place in 28 weeks later. This one starts with everyone's favorite hero, Don, willing to do what it takes to save, wait scratch that, willing to run away from his wife and leave her to her fate to be devoured by infected, brought on by a young boy showing up seeking refuge, and then after it all hits the fan, running away from the rest of your group to save your own skin. You can already tell, he's pretty much the hero we deserve. After Don's definite not retreat but advance in another direction, he escapes via boat. After a short while, the infected naturally begin to become bodied by starvation as NATO forces take control of Britain once again. 28 weeks after the outbreak, Team America has arrived under the command of Brigadier General Stone and bring in settlers. That's right, bring in settlers to an area that is near a hot zone and still actively is assumed to be a hot zone as it hasn't really been cleared yet. Instead of clearing the area entirely house by house making sure no infected remain, they instead bus in civilians into a controlled area and re-establish the population six months after an outbreak that almost completely annihilated the population of England. This safe area is known as the Isles of Dogs. Don's children are reunited with him, but the kids will be kids and they decided to go into the hot zone that they saw the horrors of firsthand and go back to their old house. I'm actually surprised an outbreak even started initially with this grade A thinking. Here, however, they come across their mother who was presumed body by the beginning of the movie. However, something is different about her. Despite being attacked, she is not infected. She does still share the burst of capillaries in her left eye, much like the other infected, though. Upon realizing his wife is still alive, Don goes 
goes to Alice, where they reconcile. But this will be short-lived. A blood sample was taken from Alice earlier, and it was determined that she was infected but asymptomatic. The issue is, even though she doesn't show symptoms, she is very much so contagious. Unbeknownst to Don, that is. When he leans in and kisses her, he is infected with the rage virus and begins to attack Alice very shortly after. And here is why you don't bust in civilians when, at minimum, a working military zone should have been established for the better part of a year. Don immediately begins turning people at the safe zone, and then those go on to infect others. Eventually, a code red is called, which basically means GTFO. Infected and non-infected are taken down alike as military attempts to contain the outbreak. Eventually, the entire city is engulfed in flames, with the two kids, a soldier, and a researcher trying to get out. Through circumstances, the kids are all that is left, with Don stalking throughout the entire movie, which, side note, is a very bizarre trait for the infected to show. Typically, complete disregard is shown for the infected's body and status, but Don acts with restraint and stealth in many situations, suggesting that while he is not immune, there is more higher thought going on in his head than what could be considered average. Don does attack his own son, biting and infecting him with the virus in the tunnels. His daughter ends him, but it is shown that his son possesses the same carrier status as his mother with the virus, clearly displaying the traits as seen in his eyes. However, he does not fly into a violent rage like the others. And it all ends on a happy note with Paris being invaded by angry infected to now spread the disease to the mainland. So if you're still with me, we have already discussed the effects of the disease and what it has on the body and the improbability of said disease. But what about carrier status? Would this be possible? And if so, how? Well, carrier status of any virus or germ is an interesting thing. And it is absolutely possible. There are many carriers of, say, MRSA, for instance, which is a bacteria that can lead to pretty severe skin infections. And some are even antibiotic resistant. But carriers may not have symptoms all the time. The herpes virus is another example of a virus that many people are carriers of and may not even be aware or have any clue of how they got it or if they are currently infected. Many with this virus have the virus lay dormant in their nerve clusters waiting to present. Some may never even have symptoms but are still able to transmit it to others. Another interesting one is the Epstein-Barr virus. This virus is a member of the herpes family and 95% of adults were found to possess the antibodies to combat EBV. So odds are you listening to this and you are an adult, congrats, you probably have Epstein-Barr virus and so do I. But even I, oddly enough, it appears to be a carrier of the flu virus. Every year the flu swings through my town, and in fact I've actually been tested for the flu and it came back positive, but I've never displayed any symptoms like fever, fatigue, muscle aches, or nausea. Instead, if I recall correctly, I just sort of sneeze a lot. But essentially, it's all based on your genetic makeup and the virus itself concerning the rage virus. Due to the chimera nature of her eyes, it may be possible for her to possess two different copies of genes that render her a carrier. This is backed by the transfer of those genes to her children when the sun becomes infected. The thinking is, is that with these genes, this allows the virus to enter the cell as if a normal infection were taking place. However, the body, while infected, does not follow the same pathway another would. In someone who's not a carrier, all the rage neural pathways are activated, leading to spasmodic events, reddening of the eyes, and leaking of the blood from eyes, ears, mouth, and other orifices. With a carrier, however, upon them being infected, the eye capillaries burst in the left eye, which seems to be the only symptom. Again, there are many reasons as to why the body would react the way it is, but what might be the reasoning for this? I believe it is coding for the neural receptors in the gene sequences. Because the virus is so effective at converting large populations, it's safe to assume it will attack those receptors in a normal person, or really just attach to them. However, bodies can be somewhat unique person to person. A small mutation in the gene sequence can lead to a completely different way that the body operates, and we call this evolution. If Alice's neural receptors were slightly different from the average person, and subsequently the chemicals produced by her body were slightly different in terms of shape, the body could still communicate, but outside infection may not be able to affect it the same way. With the addition of this rage virus and its subsequent inhibitors, which are actually activators, this means that they would not be able to properly attach to her neural receptors. Because of this, she does not display the actual symptoms of rage. However, this would not be enough. As we see with the infected, they are leaking quite readily all over the place. So why not her? After the virus enters her body, she should essentially have Ebola symptoms minus the rage, right? Well, this may also be due to specific set of genetics. If they are changing the receptors in the brain, then they may have the ability to actually change the receptors on the cell themselves. Because of this, the rage virus may have difficulty attaching to these cells. And based on this, they may proliferate only within the bloodstream without causing harm to the organ function as clearly she is still living, eating, and drinking. So presumably it may be affecting her red blood cells or white blood cells as well as the salivary glands, but not the organs themselves. So without the breakdown of this tissue, she can continue living and spreading the disease unknowingly. Another possibility is that the virus itself has mutated much like it did with the chimps. After the proliferation of this virus amongst the public, the disease would have passed 
passed through many people, interacted with many genetic coatings and immune systems. She may have been infected with a version that may be comparable to the flu rather than Ebola, given its mutagenic nature. Ebola can outright take out a host, but won't proliferate well, whereas the flu may take out the host, but typically it will have enough time to be spread. So its lethality is decreased for the price of increased longevity. But again, seeing as Don was infected with the disease and turned, his son was infected with the same disease because he bit him and not turned, I would have to agree that this all boils down to genetics. So I bet you didn't know that there's probably going to be a third movie on this. Apparently they met up in 2019 to discuss it, and my money is it being called 28 months later. Anyhow, this was, I believe, the longest video I've done to date. I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, please leave a like as I worked pretty hard on this one, so feel free to like, share it, and do all that good stuff. I'll drop my Twitter, Discord, Patreon, and second channel links in the description if that interests any of you, and would also like to thank a few of my patrons. First up, it's our lone astronaut, It's Not a Spoon. Thanks, bro. Next up, our scientists are Freedom Units 44, Skilt, and Trey Windenall. Thank you to you as well, my guys. And to the rest of my patrons, as always, I thank you as well. Your help goes a long way. All right, so that's a wrap on that one. I hope you guys have a good one. Uh, enjoy your weekend, and I will see y'all in the next one.